Hey everyone, and welcome to the Americana Station podcast. Super excited today to have Christina Vane on the podcast, and we're talking about her new record and what's been going on with her. Actually, shortly after we inter- did the interview, uh, she came down with COVID and had to cancel a few dates. Um, so get well soon. I hope you're doing better, Christina. And um, uh, this new record's fantastic. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, yesterday, I spent the whole day out in Fairview, Tennessee, and uh, I was shooting my new music video for my upcoming album, and uh, I think I got heat exhaustion because I am so dead today, Um, but um, normally I do these in the morning and put them out uh, on Mondays, sometimes on Fridays, but I've I've just been literally laying around on the couch today, exhausted. Um, So I'm finally getting around to doing this. Um, It's coming out a little late, I apologize for that, but... Um, yeah, super excited to, to talk to Christina today. Um, upcoming episodes of the podcast include David Newbold, um, Afton Wolf, and Mary Scholes. So um, there's a lot of good ones coming up, more in the pipeline. So make sure you click that subscribe button so you get all the podcasts. Uh, make sure you rate and review so we get more uh, coverage and, and more people can see about the Americana Station podcast. And uh, we got a lot more news coming up in the future, but today we're going to talk to Christina Vane, so let's go. So, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for uh, coming on. I know you're busy. Do you do you have a gig today at seven? No, I do not. Oh, okay. I, I just looked on Facebook and it said Urban Cantina. Uh, that's in about a week. Oh, cool, cool. And a half, yeah. Right on. Um, so you've been super busy. You have a new record uh, that just dropped pretty recently. Um, tell us about it. Uh, yeah. How, how long has it been out? When did it come out? So it came out May 20th and I'm super excited about that. It's been, I guess, not that long of a time coming because I released one exactly a year, pretty much almost exactly a year before that. So um, it basically is just the next succession of songs. And I like to look at albums like a sort of chronological snapshot of where you were at during that time when you wrote those collection of songs, you know? Um, So... Yeah, there's a little bit more of, of a return to my rock kind of roots, a little bit more of like a rock feel, um, but there's still a pretty wide array of things, which is kind of what I like to do. There's some banjo songs, some a little bit of a country sound and shuffle, some country blues songs, a hill country tune, and then some like some rock tunes and blues rock tunes too. So yeah, I'm really proud of it. That's awesome. Have you been touring with a band or just kind of going solo? I've been doing both actually. Yeah. I've toured solo for a long time and that is, it's, that's fun too. But when I can get the band with me, it's, it's, it makes for a good time. For sure. Yeah, definitely is a lot more fun if you can bring a band. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I just looked at your tour schedule and it looks pretty jam packed. You've got most of July, August, September, you got some festivals coming yeah. up. Um, what are you most excited about? Oh man, it's hard to say. I was actually just working on my website today. Um, so I was sort of going over all of those things and I was getting excited yeah. about a bunch of them. I'm excited to go out to California at the end of this month. It's been a long time since I've been out there. Um, and I'm excited to be going to Asheville and then, you know, Colorado is a whole dreamy place in Arizona. And then we have that uh, festival in Pagosa Springs, the Four Corners Folk Festival. And so, yeah, it, it should be really fun. Wow. Yeah. I see that you're doing the folk festival and you're booking it back for the station in gig uh, a few days later. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. I, I was just thinking about the, I remember when I was gearing up for my tour run around March. And I remember messaging you and asking you if you were canceling your gigs too, because we were kind of 
Oh yeah. I remember that too. That new Orleans run I was supposed to do. Yeah. And it was like right at the, the beginning of everything shutting down. And I, I, I just remember being like, I really want to do these gigs. I put so much time and effort into them. Let me see yeah. what these other people are doing. <laughs> and and totally. we're all just like, I have no idea what to do. And then we all had to cancel everything. So it's good to see that you're uh, picking back up and, and getting things going. Yeah, it's been, I mean, as you know, it's been like a winding couple of years for music and I am, uh, yeah, I'm just hoping that people get used to going out again. I think that for better or for worse, you know, a lot of people got used to being at home and consuming the stuff that we create at home, which is great when you're in a pandemic, but, um, you know, now that we're sort of in this in-between phase where it's not officially over, but it's also going to run its course. I feel like if you can make it out to a show and you're listening to this, go to that show. If you feel like staying home, don't stay home. <laughs> we stayed home a lot. Yeah. You got to push yourself a little bit. That's definitely uh I mean, I feel it as a, you know, when I'm not performing, especially because yeah. of touring, it's like hard to get the energy to go see my friends play or go, you know, do outside world stuff. But, um, I think it is really important and I've started to feel better now that I've seen some people that I haven't seen in a while and actually made an effort to go out. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think Headley's playing tonight at D's and I, I keep trying mm -hmm. to talk myself into going <laughs> because, you know, it's just, it's hard. It's hard whenever you spend so much time at home and, um, I, you know, uh, I've been dealing with, you know, custody with my daughter, uh, which I've told you a little bit about. And so, yeah. uh, you know, like finding the, the, the pockets that you have, you know, uh, to, to do things you have to like, uh, well, I have to really push myself to, mm -hmm. you know, um, like I, I was working on booking a run, uh, the like one week in August that I have where I'm not going to have my daughter and just like take that whole week and just go out because, you know, totally with, with everything going on, you just got to, take what you can and just kind of push yourself. So that's definitely something I've been doing. Yeah. I'm with you. It's just, uh, it's just rough, but it's also great. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, where have you been so far? Um, in the last few um, months? Well, I just came back from Georgia and that was a solo run. That was really fun. I, before that was with the band in Asheville, we opened for town mountain in, in Lexington. And, um, then let's see, we played Kentucky. I did a Northeastern run earlier this summer. Um, and then Georgia again. So it's been a lot of like the closer stuff, I guess, mm -hmm. except the Northeast, um, and some Asheville shows and stuff like that. Do you play, uh, you know, I, I, at least in maybe I'm completely wrong. Uh, so you can correct me if so, but you kind of have like a, an affinity for that, like Mississippi Delta sound. Uh, do you find yourself playing down in that area much? Um, yeah, well, I used to play down there more often as in, you know, whenever I tried to make a tour happen, I included Clarksdale mm -hmm. and that's uh, pretty much the only place I played in Mississippi. Um, you know, I, love delta blues but i don't i'm not like a traditionalist and i'm always a little like intimidated <laughs> going to the actual heart and the source of these people that inspire me and you know seeing it done like so much better basically and then being like well here's my weird modern version of this old blues tune it's like i don't know um it's very intimidating. So I need to get back in the swing of there and go down there. Cause I, I got to play the juke joint festival, I think mm -hmm. before pandemic. And that was a really good time. And, um, yeah. So I want to go back down to Mississippi. It's got such a vibe. Yeah. It's, it is, it is weird though, because, you know, I'm from, uh, Southern Louisiana and, um, it, it's weird because there are good gigs, but there's so few and far between too. Um, so right. it's hard to, for people outsiders to get those gigs. Yeah, that's how I feel about Louisiana. Oh, general. for sure. Um, yeah, they, they but I guess a lot of places are like that. They definitely kind of uh are a little bit insular uh down there, which sucks sometimes. But, but it does a good job of preserving, you know, the culture and the tradition. So it I don't I'm not mad at it. <laughs> that's true. 
So you studied under, sorry, I definitely didn't do my homework before. Uh, oh, you're good. Um, you studied under Pete oh Steinberg. Thank you, Pete Steinberg. I was looking yeah. through your bio. Um, it's a long bio. Yeah. Uh, so he taught you the, the finger style uh, that you've kind of come to um, make your own. Yeah, I learned Travis picking finger style guitar from Pete when I was out in L.A. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a lot of right hand different finger style techniques that I've kind of learned since or taken from different blues people that I like. But the basic Travis style stuff was um, pretty new to me when I met Pete and he specifically, you know, focused on that and, and was really just an angel sent from heaven. He, you know, mentored me for free for a long time and taught me pretty much everything I know and left wow. me with a stack of tabs and all the materials to keep teaching his stuff actually. So, um, that's what I try and do when I teach people myself. And when you, when you did the banjo, that wasn't with, um, Steinberg that you just kind of learned on your own. Yeah. I took one lesson with the McCabe's guitar teacher, John Rosen, um, mm -hmm. But that was after I'd already sort of started to teach myself. And I think, you know, my friend Gina Leslie, who's actually out of New Orleans, um, she taught me, she was living in Venice too at the time and we were, we were good friends. So she's the one who first sort of taught me the basic claw hammer move. And um, I then just worked at it myself for a very long time. Yeah. Were you gigging when you were uh, out in Italy? No, I moved no. here when I was 18. So, okay. you know, that was like, an, actually, it's funny because I did play like a battle of the bands with my school <laughs> in middle school when I was living there. Um, and like maybe one other little show with my like little punk band friends. But I don't really I didn't like, you know, I was 13, so I didn't gig. Right. So then you moved here to go to school. You went to Princeton and got mm -hmm. a degree in comparative literature. I'm obviously reading your bio and uh <laughs> And then you just kind of started picking up music as, as you uh, were kind of going to school. Um, I was, I've always been into music, so I've always been playing. I just didn't gig when I was. Young. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I've always played music. I've always sang um, in choirs and played the flute. I picked up the guitar in middle school and started writing in high school. So I've been at it for a minute. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Did you like, did you grow up doing like the, the blues and bluegrass and folk kind of stuff? Or, you know, I, I saw in there that, you know, you, you see yourself kind of as a rock player that uh, fell in love with the folk music. Uh, was it, did the love of music start with rock or was it always kind of traditional? Um, well, it really started before I think I even listened to music. I mean, maybe I heard it when I was a baby, but I just always liked music. I sang to myself when I was a baby in the crib and did little dances and stuff. And um, so I think I've just always liked music and whether it was like, you know, memories from the musical cats that I was learning on the piano or like, like some cool Latin song I was learning in choir. I really loved classical music. Um, and I really liked rock and punk when I got sort of a little older. So I've always been a big consumer of pretty wide variety of things. Um, but a lot of indie, a lot of rock, a lot of punk, some metal, like, you know, the soft stuff like Metallica or whatever. But um, yeah, the British indie scene was pretty big in my high school, you know, days, as well mm -hmm. as like the pop punk scene. I was a big Blink-182 fan, still am. So I don't know. I, um, yeah, I, I was like a world away from bluegrass and blues and all that stuff. So you just sort of like, I guess I'm trying to find like where, where did that end up crossing into your realm to kind of create what you've been doing lately? Um, did you pick that up in LA or previous to that? Um, yeah, I started playing slide guitar after I uh, saw somebody playing Sam Green in England, Sam Green and the Midnight Heist was the band, but I saw them play and he played lap, lap slide stuff. And I thought that was really cool. And then I was in college in New Jersey and then I moved to LA and somehow stumbled into, um, oh, it was because of Rory Block. I don't know how I found her, but she does a Skip James tribute album. That's amazing. And 
um, listened to her stuff a lot, listened to Skip James, and then listened to um, Blind Willie Johnson once I figured out that In My Time of Dying is not a Led Zeppelin song. And in fact, it's an old <laughs> traditional that Blind Willie Johnson recorded in 1927. So um, yeah, so it was like a few things that sort of got me there. And then I uh, I just like listened to that, those two particular people on repeat for months and months and months. It's so funny when you hear stuff like that, like, you you know, that you didn't know that uh, Led, Led Zeppelin was covering it. Um, you know, there's I've heard stories of people that like love the In the Pines Nirvana unplugged thing and didn't yeah. realize that that was a traditional as well. Yeah, there's a lot of songs like that. I mean, um, I could I mean, another time that I felt that very strongly wasn't a specific song. It was just the black keys I had listened to a lot and I had never heard original hill country blues. So when I heard junior Kimbrough for the first time, I was like, um, who is this? And was he alive before or after the black keys? <laughs> and, um, the, you know, the guitar tech started laughing. He was like, this is junior Kimbrough and he definitely came before them. So, uh, you know, there's nothing, new under the sun there's nothing wrong with covering songs too but i do know led zeppelin claimed to have written that song originally in my time of dying and they definitely didn't write that song so they did some sneaky stuff i i have to uh, this this one's not as cool um i was listening to dave matthews band and heard long black veil and thought it was so such a i was like this is his best song <laughs> yeah, that's funny yeah then totally. i kind of downloaded uh you know, the Johnny Cash version and then realized that, oh, that's not either. That's just a traditional, you know, that everyone does. Right. So that was kind of my entry into like the whole like folk punk at uh, folk punk, f- folk country uh, realm. It was from Dave Matthews band. I can't believe I'm saying that on the podcast. Oh, it's OK. I I got no time for people that judge people because I have met the whole range of stuff. Like I know people that can name every folk song ever and play every bluegrass tune, but did, can't name an ACDC song. And I don't think making fun of anybody is worth my time. So I try not to get, I don't know, caught up in the whole like Nashville. <laughs> oh, you don't know who this is. And you've never heard of John Prine. It's like, dude, some people haven't heard of John Prine. You got to just, you know, accept that and teach them about it if you care so much. Right. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that, that's always been weird to me. Like I'm really bad with nineties country because um, at the time I was uh, kind of going anti country because I grew up in a small, you know, country town where everything was country music and I didn't want to be that. And so I don't really like, I'm still relearning nineties country music. I don't really know it at all or early two thousands. And people are always like, Oh my God, you don't know this song. I'm like, no, I don't. I blocked it yeah. out for, for 15 years totally and it's kind of like I don't know you know uh again like you can ask if someone's joking one time like I did when my friend said that he didn't know ACDC and then when they say no I'm not joking you just tell them you know it's like don't make people feel stupid I like that that's good that's good are you a Doc Watson fan I feel yeah, like I'm a big Doc be. Watson fan yeah. yeah big fan I I love Doc Watson so much and uh you know, every time I've seen you play, I've always wondered and meant to ask you that because it's definitely, I mean, well, you're, you're playing similar styles and instruments as well that kind of go with that. Well, yeah. I mean, thank you for even associating me ever with Doc Watson in your mind. Cause you know, he's pretty untouchable, but the greatest hits Doc Watson greatest hits uh, compilation was sort of my primer to him. And that Hank Williams, JJ Kale, and mm-hmm. Jerry Reed were like my soundtrack for a whole summer when I was traveling 2018. I was on the road for five months and I think I just literally only listened to those five people. So the first time I met you, you were you were wearing a Jerry Reed jacket and we bought it. Oh my gosh, over that it. thing is, yeah, that thing is my pride <laughs> and joy. <laughs> I feel like if anyone hears this that has seen that jacket, they know about it because I've either talked about it or they've said something. It's just such a cool jacket. Yeah, it was one of their uh, band members, right? No, I don't think band member. What I was told is that it was from a promotional like uh, run of those jackets for the team. So like the manager and the booker and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if the band also had them or or not. And I don't really even technically know if that's true. But I believe the person that I got it from, they're 
pretty reputable vintage collector. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so are you working on any new material? Are you, are you planning on releasing one next year, next May? Oh man, I don't think that I can, uh, with the schedule that I've had this year. Um, I just really haven't gotten around to, it would be, it would be like forcing it, I think, to try and, and release something by May. I'm sure as you know, uh, putting out a record is like, yeah, you like start a year before you plan to put it out. And I, um, I have not even thought about that. I haven't been writing that much, but I have so much like just these small snippets of things that turn into songs that I could probably whip together an album. I just don't think, you know, with the amount of effort and money that goes into them, I don't want it to be like a haphazard thing. So it would be cool to maybe release it next fall, but you know, all the, the, freaking music industry people are like never don't do that only in the spring and i'm like i don't really know so we'll see whenever it's ready it'll be ready really they say not in the fall no not everybody but i've been told Mm. that yeah 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 are you did you co-write any on this record the only co-write on there is uh a musical co-write like i brought this thing I had written mostly to Kyle Tuttle. We were playing double banjo a lot at the time because he's a banjo player and I play claw hammer mm-hmm. and he plays Scruggs style. And uh, yeah. And so, you know, I was playing and I was like, Hey, what do you think of this? And we kind of, he kind of like filled in a lot of the stuff that was missing and came up with a cool lick there. And so I wrote some words and, and that made it onto the record. Billy Contreras is the fiddle player on that track. It's called Oxbow Meander Loop. Yeah, he's such a good fiddle player. Yeah, he's unreal. Yeah. Kyle's also really good, too. He he does, like, the electric thing. Yeah, he likes to get funky on the banjo, but he can play pretty much any which way. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Sorry, give me a second. No worries. Trying to make it at least 40 minutes, uh, so I'm trying to fill in the time with questions and stuff. Oh, I know where I want to go with this next. So when you're writing, um, how, how do you usually write a song? Do you like sit down with the purpose of writing or is it more like a, a creative inspiration in the moment? When I write, um, it really depends. A lot of times I will be fiddling with my instrument and something will come out that I like. That's usually mm-hmm. how I start a song. Other times. I have an idea. It's pretty rare, but sometimes I have a really strong idea for like a lyric or a, even just a premise, but that's not as common. And then other times I have inspiration for a feel. I'm like, I really want to write a country blues sounding tune. And so mm-hmm. I'll go from that and kind of come up with the music. And then I put lyrics to it later. And uh, yeah, and so it's usually music first, lyrics, uh, well, melody second singing melody and then fill in the lyrics to fit that melody so I try and just sort of like build a block basically or whatever it's called uh Mm -hmm. lego my way into a song do you do you find that like having that degree in literature helps with like writing lyrics creative lyrics and stuff like that um you know like I I hope so but to be honest (laughs) uh I think that I always liked writing I always liked poetry even if I hadn't gone to college and filled my brain with all these amazing things, I probably would have been reading cool stuff anyway. And it's mm-hmm. not like I often sit down and I'm like, I'm going to reference Baudelaire in this song. And I'm going <laughs> to reference like Garcia Lorca in this one. Um, so, you know, I, my degree in comparative literature was like basically a literature degree in different languages, which was really fun and fulfilling, but I don't often find myself like thinking about that specifically when I write, I usually just write. And I think all the things that have informed my writing, you know, have made me the writer that I am today. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. It's weird because like, I, I mean, I have a degree in uh, communications and uh, right on. I don't think that that would have, affected and i even took some songwriting classes uh, because i had a music minor um but i don't honestly i don't even think the songwriting classes really helped that much because at that point i was already a songwriter 
Yeah, totally. I feel like sometimes, you know, I've learned some really cool stuff from different people along the way. Um, and that like, maybe even if you do a whole class, but all you remember is one little trick or something. Like I just remember someone somewhere telling me, you know, oh, songwriting is like a muscle. You have to do it. And there's a reason mm-hmm. it feels harder when you go for a while and you don't. And just knowing that very simple fact, you know, has made it easier sometimes for me to go easy on myself when I'm picking up writing after a long break. I'm like, yeah, it's not going to be easy at first. Yeah. My trick is always just get the shit song out. So like, just write totally. the thing that you're going to hate and yeah. then move on. So it doesn't like, don't like, I don't know. Like that's, that's always been my trick when I start writing again is like, I'm just going to write one that's just terrible and then just throw it aside and not care about it. Yeah, totally. Cause then you got it out of your system and you're, you're getting back into the habit and uh, yeah, it helps me a lot. <laughs> Amen. I wanted to talk about, you were just on WMOT. They had like a, a cool thing with uh, you and Nikki Lane. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was last night. That was Wednesday already. Yeah. Wednesday. Okay. That was Wednesday. Yeah. So I got to hear some of you on the radio. It sounded great. Um, oh, cool. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Yeah. It was super cool. And I heard Nikki say she wants to take you on the road. Oh man. That's yeah. That would be <laughs> awesome. Um, so that was, that was super cool. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, <laughs> but it was well, cool to hear you just like be driving and hearing you on the radio. Yeah, it's definitely cool for me. I mean, I uh, listened to WMOT. I wasn't, I'm not much of a radio person historically. Like we didn't listen, we listened to a lot of CDs in my house. And Mm -hmm. um, so I never really tuned into the radio until like the pandemic when I would often go drive for like basically, you know, an hour, usually most days to go hike somewhere new and like go be in a river or something when it was like, really, there was nothing to do. Mm -hmm. And I started listening to WMOT and yeah, the local brew and all those shows are just like, so awesome. So, uh, you know, to be on there, especially opening for someone as cool as Nikki Lane was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anna Lee's great. Um, she's severely underrated what she's doing for all the local people here. Um, and she, she's been doing it for a long time. She used to do it for uh, lightning 100 too. Um, I actually had her on the podcast a couple of years ago. Um, got to talk to her about her career and stuff like that. And she's just such a champion of, you know, local artists and super awesome to, um, have someone like that, you know, playing people like us on the, on the radio for totally. Here. And like, I love, um, Amy Alvey started an old time segment too. Yes. And it's so good. And, you know, I was already honored enough that she played my song um, since I'm not strictly old time, but the, the segment was just so good. And we heard like friend after friend after friend. I was like, I know those people. I know those people too. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's a really good thing because it's all super high quality stuff and, um, and they deserve to be playing it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, so where are you headed to next? I mean, I know we got, you got stuff through October. Um, is there anything, uh, on the horizon that you're looking forward to? Uh, I know you're not going to release another record for quite a while. Are you going to keep running through this one, the rest of 22 and 23? Well, what usually happens is I write new songs and they start going into my live set even before I put them on a record, which is kind of what's happened with this one. And the one before I was playing those songs, like probably for two years before they actually came out. So, you know, I plan to obviously write some more and continue that train. I just don't really know when I'm going to put something out and yeah, just keep like plug in away and touring. And then I like to teach, uh, when stuff calms down and I don't really like to go on the road when it's like snowing and awful out. So, um, yeah, maybe teaching some in the winter time. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on, uh, Christina. Um, so glad to catch up with you and and hear about your new record. Um, what's the, for asking me about it for sure. What's the best way to, for people to, to listen to you just, uh, your website or uh, yeah, you know, I'm on Spotify, but boo Spotify, they don't pay anybody. <laughs> I know a lot of people have it though. So you just got to do what you got to do. But, um, 
you can find me on Bandcamp, my website. Uh, you can order a physical CD if you like holding stuff in your hand. I think there's going to be vinyl out in probably a few weeks. That's so what your website anyone, says. Vinyl option anyone's, coming soon. Yeah, it's like thanks Adele for yeah whatever you did like last year <laughs> just made vinyl production go absolutely upside down. But yeah, there will be vinyl soon, which is really exciting because it is my first vinyl. I don't know how well it's going to, you know, move given that we're like a few months after the release now, but I really hope people, you know, just save space for the record. I'm yeah, I'm, I ran out of money. Like I, I spent over 10 grand on this record and, um, Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't get vinyl and so people are going to have to wait. So I hope same, same for you and, and me both. Like once it, you can actually get it out that people will buy it. I think so, because I'd honestly, to be completely honest, I would much rather have your record on vinyl than CD. I have Josh Headley's vinyl and I am like so happy that I got one. So I get it. Totally get it. I'm a vinyl person myself. Yeah. Yeah. Nick Nace just uh, delivered his vinyl to me the other day and it was super cool to see that. Nice. Well, thanks so much for stopping by. Um, and everyone, go check out Christina. Oh, thanks, girl. Thanks for having me. Nice to talking to you. You too. I'm going to make myself me again. Hey, that's it for this episode of the podcast. Um, make sure you are subscribed so you get more episodes. Uh, rate and review if you would like that would be super helpful um, if you go to the Apple store and just click the little five star review that helps out a lot too even if you don't feel like typing up a review and uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks with David Newbold thank you we'll see ya Sometimes I 